My father was threatening to make me sign something on 14 January 2011. He was outside saying he would break the door I did not open the door. He was a bit too old and weak to break down a door. But he has a big ego and likes to lower me. What I had to sign was for my father to take control of my immigration affairs. And I already knew a little bit about what my father planned to after taking such control. I had been released from Yarlswood on the 14th of December 2010 under the premise I was not in a fit mental state to travel. It is discretionary for UKBA to accept that explanation. Since people about to board a plane won't normally have money, certainly not time to get an external doctor to help write that testimony. My father had found a lawyer who pleased him well, as well as a psychiatrist of similar disposition. My father had said I would spend 30 minutes with a psychiatrist and exit from his back door with indefinite leave to remain. My father said after that I would never be able to work. I would have a council flat and my life ahead of me. I was angry that my father would make me so strongly mentally incompetent, no one would employ me after that. I was also angry I was going to live in a council flat which is means tested and was going to conceal his means. Mainly, I don't know about other people, but I cannot live under a fraudulent mental health charge. How do I know a mental health charge is fake? If the nature of the charge, if I may use that word, is incomprehensible to all humans except the specialist, it is fake. Like, astrology and tarot readings are fake. I mean such psychic readings sometimes are correct but hardly respected. An accuser should take full responsibility to explain feelings they are gripped by that someone is mental. If she cannot provide enough detail, including why the so-and-so woman, she is probably jealous of needs her head examined. Because mental health gives women so many ego boosters, which are at the expense of others, they can express feelings but they should not be taken seriously as they are not equal in mental status to who they speak to. Going back to my story. My father kicked and banged on the door on the 14th of January 2011 to force me to sign my consent, giving him control over my immigration. How could this godfather expect his child to respond at the ego level of a prostitute? I am not British, and also not a British street person. I think the higher classes in Britain probably care a bit more about their reputation. I am sorry if I am mistaken or gave offense to anyone. If the police want it, that's them. I called the police about my father, and they said if your father asks you to open the door and sign a document, you must obey because you are mentally ill. I was shocked and humiliated and took an overdose. My father had told the Pembroke Mental Center of Ryslip that I was in a fake relationship with my boyfriend. This would jeopardize my immigration, if UKBA took the Pembroke seriously. They were the Pembroke. My parents were my only relative. Which is awkward, since I was avoiding my parents so much that they made a bogus missing person report to humble me. In early 2010, during one visit to my parents' home before this hell started, I overheard my late mother say to my father, and quote, I want Mahini's ego to be raised to the ground. What I am not sure British people may not know about my father as an old, retired person is the seniority he has enjoyed in his life. Not so much in the UK, but back in India, where he was chairman of Indian Drugs and Pharmaceuticals Limited. He and my mother also dined with Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. This should give you an idea of how my dad is used to wielding power over a system with much stronger egos than the Pembroke system, 
since people under him and his opposition did not consist of illiterate chickens like the Pembroke. Making mischief with police help is an old trick mastered by my father in India, where police abuses do not have that intimate, personal touch. Although, I admit, unreasonable actions by the police may not be pleasant in any country. I mean daddy gets a bit of fun outsmarting the system. This is taken in a negative light by the British, although not by Indians, who take it in their stride. The only problem I have is my maltreatment. In India, police won't come if there's a family feud but in America you know they'll come and they'll say that I have a right not to open my door it's not a moral thing the law is not mixed with morals. Never expected the police to say you are crazy and you are mentally ill so you should be obeying your father and they also said they sent somebody and my father wasn't there but they sent you are imagining it they said I was so upset I taped them but I didn't use the tape I was completely crushed. Less than 48 hours later I took an overdose. I had taken an overdose in January 2011 police abuse incident. My boyfriend rushed me to the hospital. When I told him I had taken one to two packs which is 16 to 32 tablets of nitol. I think I had a very bad heart attack after an hour by which time I was in a hospital bed. That was a very strange night at Hillingdon Hospital. What night it would have been safer to have a heart attack on the pavement than on a hospital bed. I was struggling for breath I told my boyfriend was standing there. I might not make it in the morning and he said if your heart stops we'll restart it the doctor came. In she said you are pretending you be asterisk 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 nothing is wrong with you your ECG is all crazy. Lie. Still. So she took off the oxygen like I was pretending. She was gone my boyfriend reconnected. The oxygen and switched it on. Heat record cold water down my throat which was stuck together and made me take gasping breaths I was unconscious for a while and didn't remember anything. I woke up on a bed in a different room to see my boyfriend's homie saying I'm going to go home. My vision was blood and I was seeing pink everywhere and I felt I was saying something came coherent and then Someone jokes with me and said something and then I was asked to get into an ambulance and go home. The hospital was pretending I didn't have a heart attack and they didn't give any cardiac care. But medical records work as a separate department. Sometimes they release the records even if doctors don't want to. I got the ECG of the overdose night. It was consistent with a heart attack. But it wasn't possible to get any doctor to admit that and we didn't ask. That night I could have died and I might have died if my boyfriend had not been there. Who knows, maybe they would have made sure I died. I do believe that is unusual for a doctor, but I felt the doctors that night were likely candidates. They didn't want anybody to know what the police did to me. That was the secret. And then the medical report had a lie that I was hale and hearty. That I walked from the hospital. Bed to the recovery room saying I have no pain and I'm feeling fine. They also lied in their report that I told them I took night all with alcohol. They also added that they gave a breathalyzer test and there was no alcohol in it. They always anticipate idiots and only idiots but I am not that much of an idiot. So, if I wanted to fake an overdose of nitol and alcohol, I would make sure I drank a good amount of alcohol and then go to accident and emergency. So that I would at least smell of drinking. I just overdosed on nitol. I did not take alcohol, and I did not say I took alcohol. The next morning, when I woke up it was the 17th of January Monday morning. This social worker guy came to me and said and quote. 
Now you must start obeying your parents. You must regularly attend meetings with Hindu women in Southall to prove to your parents that you don't have psychosis. Then this won't happen again to you. And quote. Once again the Hindu stuff. I had already reminded them I was a Christian, but the Pembroke Mental Center had informed them I was a Hindu. And next to my age, they wrote, Prime Minister. That is where my medical story begins. I had not had any illness before. A couple of months later, I had another event. I was traveling on a bus when my left side became very weak. I got off at the next stop and managed to get to a pub where I sat down and told them that I needed an ambulance. The ambulance took me to Carry Cross Hospital, and by the time I got there my left-sided weakness had subsided. But my troponin was high, and they made me stay overnight so that after 12 hours, they could measure my troponin again. I don't know if I had a heart attack because all that happened was my left side becoming extremely weak, but they did not report it. Doctors would not tell me if I had a heart attack. That is a permanent thing existing even in 2023. After measuring my troponin again in the morning, they asked me to go home. I guess it might have been a small heart attack not involving chest pain, but they gave me no documentation. Between February 2011 and early 2014, I did not have any health problems.